inviting me as well. I think this is probably the first talk that I've given face to face for about two years and it's nice to be reminded that heads have bodies attached to them. Normally I'm used to seeing disembodied heads floating around on a Zoom screen. So it's um it's a pleasure to be here today. So thank you. So yeah my name is Jolene Chesworth. I am the head of engagement and communities at Somerset Wildlife Trust. So I work with a team of people whose job it is is to really help people and encourage people to connect to nature, to go out, to explore, to enjoy it and to feel that sense of values towards it and then provide opportunities for them in turn to get something about nature um, so that they can help look after it. I'm going to talk today about our vision, if you like, for, for a while in some sense. And we use the term wilder rather than rewilding usually because for us it's about restoring nature across the county and that might take different forms. It might include rewilding in its purest sense in some areas through to more traditional um, conservation techniques on nature reserves, for instance, uh, nature-friendly farming, through to uh, not mowing your lawn quite so often uh, during the month of May. Um, so a whole range of different ways of helping to create a wilder Somerset. I'm going to start with a bit of local context. So Somerset Wildlife Trust is the largest uh, nature conservation organisation working exclusively in Somerset. We manage around 70 nature reserves, so that's about four and a half thousand acres or if you struggle to picture what an acre looks like, it's about 3,000 football pitches, um, which helps me to visualise it. Um, we've got some incredible uh, sort of areas of ancient woodland or places like the Mendips and the Black Down Hills, where I live, through to internationally renowned wetlands down on the Avalon marshes um, in some set of levels and moors, uh, and then some incredible wildflower meadows. And there's one not far from here called Bab Carey, and I'd recommend going there so June and July next year if you haven't been uh, to see what a, a a really traditional wildflower meadow looks like and also what it sounds like which is one of the most mind-blowing things when you sit there amongst it and you hear that buzz of the bees and and you can always feel the, the wing beats of the butterflies as they go past your head um so these nature reserves that we we own and manage they're just part of a, a number of really important sites for wildlife across somerset so we've got about 45 miles of coastline Dorset doesn't have the only Jurassic coast in the country. Somerset has one too, and it's really rich in fossils and wildlife. We've got a bit of a national park. We've got four areas of outstanding natural beauty. We've got special areas of conservation, special protection areas, triple SIs. We've got everything, you know, you name it, we, we, we've got it, including over 2,000 local wildlife sites, which are actually really important, really good areas for local communities to involve themselves. And all of this adds up to around 13,000 recorded species. And we've probably seen pictures of, you know, the cute things with the whiskers and the fur, like the otters and the dormice. We know we have those. The unsung wildlife that we also have that we should value with a bit more. So sun stars the size of dinner plates that can regrow their own arms if they're damaged, through to moths the size of your own nose. Um, in this case, it's a copper hawk moth. And I think Sarah made a really good point earlier in that it's not just about conserving rare species. It's actually about promoting the not so rare and allowing them to recover their abundance as they once were. So it's about you know, supporting um, common things to be common, to maintain their commonality, if you like, not just conserving what we've already almost lost. So that all sounds brilliant. So what's the issue? Why are we all here and why are we concerned? About two months ago by the Natural History Museum, just prior to 26, that suggested that we've lost about half of our wildlife. Whereas globally, uh, the average is a loss of about 25%. So we are one of the most nature deficit countries. And that's driven by uh, changes in our habitat. So about 97% of the wildflower meadows have been lost, ancient woods have gone, and about 150,000 kilometres of hedgerow have also gone. And I know CPRE are really interested in hedgerows, and I, I am too. So I just thought I'd quickly show you this picture. If you ever, uh, you know, aboard for five minutes, then have a look on the National Library of Scotland website. It's an amazing resource and it allows you to see old maps still are over 100 years later and also been lost as well. Um, so if you ever want to know what's going on in your area around hedgerows, then do have a look at that. This is a picture that um, is just from Somerton, so um, it's where we are today. So I'll let you read the rest of the stats, but I think one of the things I would like to say is that um, Somerset Environment Record Centre have looked at, our, looked at the land and its use and its management around Somerset 
Um, and they found that only about 10% of that land can be considered to be in demonstrable good quality native habitat. So about 10% of Somerset is in good condition for nature in, in shorthand. Um, so that's why we need to do something about it, because 10% is not really sufficient. So our vision at Somerset Wildlife Trust, um, and this is part of our new strategy that we recently launched, um, is for a Somerset-wide nature recovery network, creating more space for wildlife, and it benefits everybody and helps us to reverse biodiversity loss and tackle climate change. So we've shifted really from focusing on conservation through to restoration and recovery. Conserving what we've got is no longer enough, we need to restore to what we once had and we need to do it in a network fashion so not just a series of fragmented sites but we need to start joining things up and it also needs to benefit everybody it's not nature versus people people are nature we need to help people to uh, participate in that nature recovery um, to, to feel a part of it and to feel the benefits as a result and if we look after nature if we help restore nature it can also help us tackle you know the, the massive issue global issue that is climate change. So I'm going to talk quickly about um, our three goals and then I'll focus more about on community um, participation and activity. So the first goal that we have is around a nature recovery network. Um, so we uh, would like to see 30% of land and sea better managed for nature. And that is actually, uh, it's a national target, it's a government target as well as a, a sort of wildlife trust target. Um, but it depends where your baseline is. And ours, as we estimated, is 10%, whereas other people suggest that because 26% of our land is designated, we've only got 4% to go, but we, we know differently. Um, and it's not just about our nature reserves, it's about trying to join up some of those important sites for nature. So land advice is really critical, working with other landowners to help them provide stepping stones and support nature within their own land holding to allow nature to move around through these, through these corridors and networks. And planning, Marielle also talked about planning, that's another really uh, critical element of what we need to do, is to work within the planning system, either to overhaul it, but to make sure that when planning applications go in, developments happen, they're done in a way that is as supportive to nature as possible, rather than simply building, building problems. Our second goal, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a moment, so I won't talk too much about it now, is around creating a movement for nature. It's about supporting people to value and participate in it. If we want to restore 30% of land and sea for, um, to be in better condition for nature, we can't do it alone. We need people to, to step up and to do what they can within their own communities and within their own resources. And we call that movement Team Wilder, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. And our third goal is around the state of nature. So that's really the evidence and the science and the monitoring that underpins all of this. It helps us to understand our baseline, so where we're actually starting from, and the impacts that we as an organisation and other organisations we work in partnership with, all the other uh, conservation organisations and landowners as well, whether we're actually having the impacts that we need. And again, a lot of this will be driven by communities, by individuals through citizen science. So we'll be launching a number of citizen science initiatives next year so people can help contribute to our understanding of the state of nature within Somerset. And of course, there already are some amazing citizen science activities going on uh, within Somerset and, and nationally that help us to do that. But it's really about tracking the changes that we hope to see um, over the next eight to 10 years. So focusing on a bit more about uh, a movement for nature then. So there's a very famous quote that I'm sure many of you would have heard of from, um, from David Attenborough. And actually, if you haven't seen David Attenborough's speech at COP26, it's well worth having a look at. It's on YouTube. The, the energy and the dynamism that that man has at the age of 95 is, is just incredible. Um, anyway, so he said uh, that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So at the very start, we want to encourage people to really access nature, to get out and to really enjoy it and to appreciate it. And that could be on one of our nature reserves, it could be in an urban park or, or a garden, anywhere, but just to sit down and take a moment. And that's really part of that nature connection process, that kind of journey whereby people have an experience, it's positive, they value it, and so they act to look after it. But there is a bit of an issue, um, and that's called the value action gap. So we've been looking at some of the social science behind this. Um, and often there's a there's a sort of a, a disparity between what people value and what people then actually do as a result. Um, so if you think of, uh, so most of us know that eating five portions of fruit and veg a day is good for you, but actually only 35% of us do it. 
So we, we value our health, but we don't necessarily always take the actions necessary to promote our health. And so what we need to do is to try and encourage people to, to bridge that gap so that they're taking action for nature. And there's a, a number of studies which have looked at social tipping points. So earlier I said that we want one in four people to take action. That's based on social science that suggests that if a significant minority of around 25% start taking visible action, then the other 75% start to recognise that and think, oh, actually, I should get involved in that as well. And you actually create a societal shift. And that's what we need to do because it's going to create this if we need a societal shift to really start looking after nature and fighting biodiversity loss and climate change. So what we're going to be doing in terms of that movement, or Team Wilder as we refer to it, it's not just community engagement, it's really community ownership and empowerment. It's not us going in and telling people what to do. Communities know themselves better than we do. Our job is really to try and facilitate conversations, to encourage communities to think about what their natural assets are, what their green spaces might be that they can help look after, what skills they have within their communities. So, and then with that, help them develop their own action plans that can help restore nature across, across Somerset. And in order to assist with that, we can offer training, which could be practical. Uh, we've been running, for instance, uh, grassland management courses, uh, which are all on our website if you're interested in managing road verges or fields and that kind of thing. Uh, or advice on stuff like pond creation, wildlife gardening, or how to engage within the planning system so that you can contribute towards neighbourhood planning processes, for instance, and actually be proactive. Um, and how some of these developments might take place. And we can also provide opportunities and action. So opportunities in terms of the ability to get involved with campaigns, both local and national, uh, or whether it might be some of those citizen science initiatives that we're looking to develop. And when I use the term community, I mean it in its broadest sense. It doesn't have to be within a village or a town. It could be more of a demographic community. So a school, for instance, or a business, or a faith-based community. We're all part of one community or another. The other thing that we're hoping to do, um, Rewild in Britain, not the only ones with a map, we all have a good map, don't we? Um, so we've just produced this on our website and we're encouraging uh, existing community groups and our new wilder communities to sign up to really highlight where they are, that peer support approach that Sarah also talked about, people sharing knowledge, sharing information is really important. So that if one community wants to help uh, restore its uh, parish meadow, then they can speak to another community that they can see has already, has already done it. Um, so that kind of information sharing sense of contributing to something bigger is really critical. Um, so I'm going to focus now more on, uh, on Wilder churches. So this is, I think, a really good example of what Team Wilder actually is and how it, how it can function. So churches uh, and churchyards and burial grounds would be amazing places for wildlife. They're often one of the few uh, bits of ground within the community which maybe hasn't been ploughed up or been uh, sprayed or chemically enriched in forms of, of fertiliser. So you can still get some of those remnant species rich grasslands which perhaps once occurred more widespread uh, across the landscape. They'll often have stone walls or dry stone walls or hedging around the borders, which are really brilliant for wildlife. And even the headstones themselves are really good habitat for things like lichens and, and mosses as well. So they can be really special places for wildlife if they're managed correctly. But they're also really sacrosanct. Churchyards are very special for people, very special for communities, especially those who maybe have um, you know, friends and family buried in them. So we have to recognise that these are spaces for people as well as spaces, potential spaces for wildlife. So, Wilder Churches came out of a conversation um, that we had with the Diocese of Bath and Wales, and we've been working very closely together to deliver this. And it's essentially a programme of online training um, for church communities um, that we've been delivering over the last uh, sort of eight to nine months. And it's really based on something called three C's. So that's consideration, consultation, and communication. It's very important when trying to change, for instance, the management of space or a churchyard, that you don't just rush in and start digging things up because all you do is upset somebody else within the community. It's very much a people-based approach to management. And so before you really do anything, you need to understand what you've got, speak to people, consult, understand how that space is actually used. Because if you don't, then all you do is upset people and you end up in a worse position than you started with. So we had our initial event with church leaders back in March 2021. Um, so that they understood what uh, the, the diocese and ourselves were, were planning on doing. And then we launched it publicly later that month. We thought we had maybe 20 people show up, but actually over 200 people came along to that first event. And we were like, wow, there's a lot of people who are really 
they're sort of excited by the opportunity of, of perhaps looking at their churchyard in, in a new light. Since then, we've run four training sessions, and it's very much a stepwise of getting to know what you've already got, understand the wildlife that you already have, and then speak to others about um, you know, how they use the site, what they would like to see within the site. So really, that consultation is, is absolutely critical. And then, only then, really, start to think in the future and try to understand whether that would be widely supported. Um, one of the best things about this, and this comes back to that kind of peer support network that I talked about, is that the Somerset Botany Group, which are a group of um, experts, uh, <coughs> botanists, have really got behind us. And they've been out as volunteers working with the other church volunteer communities to help them survey and map their sites and think about some of the, um, the opportunities for management change and help them develop uh, those plans and produce reports. So it's really a great example of volunteers, different communities working together nature restoration and we've had some brilliant uh, churches all over the county have been carrying out their surveys often using citizen science involving local communities to come in and help them you know count the invertebrates people have been writing in their parish magazines about ability in order to create that movement you have to shout about what you're doing um, and there's some churchyards for instance you know they've had a great deal of success they've been drawing little plots so starting small before scaling up potentially. Um, others have uh, decided that they would like to perhaps take on the management of a field, explore to one particular churchyard and expand what they're doing. Others are looking to sort of expand them to the road verges surrounding their churchyard. Another church uh, was able to replace the plans for building a wall as a boundary and instead turn that into a, into a hedge. So gradually we're seeing in just a short time, church communities working within their churches, having success, but also that activity kind of spilling out into the wider community. And that's really what we want to see in terms of developing that movement. So what can you do right now? Uh, well, the first thing, if you're interested in Team Wilder and being a part of that movement is to look at our website. There's a whole load of resources and training opportunities on there. We have a dedicated email address if you want to find out how we can support you or you have a particular idea for your community, then get in touch and we can try and um, support you to do that. We've got a dedicated Facebook page where there's an opportunity to connect to other groups. And of course, you can put yourself on our map if you're already doing something. And if you're not, you can see what else is going on maybe in your area and join them as well. And then we also have a newsletter which goes out monthly, which um, shines a light on the activity that's going on, provides opportunities for, for funding, for instance, if you if you want to do something. And really, you know, whether you're part of Team Wilder, part of CPRE, Rewilding Britain, the most important thing you can do is to do something, even if it seems small, even if it's just in your garden, it still all helps to create that nature recovery network. Uh, and I would like to finish it there. Thank you very much.